Beyond the Tenth by Tuesday Love Sang Rampa Read for you by Blue Friend in beautiful B.C. October 2017 The title To save a lot of questions later, let me say now that man is one-tenth conscious, the other nine-tenths deal with the subconscious, and all that which comes under the heading Racial Memories and the Occult. This book is about you, not just about one-tenth of you, but also that which goes beyond the tenth. A Special Letter Dear Reader, for over a decade you've been writing to me from all over the world, even from the other side of the Iron Curtain, writing to me some thirty or forty letters a day, letters which I have conscientiously answered. But quite a number of you have written to say that an author of books such as mine belongs to the reader, saying that an author such as I cannot end with nine books, but must go on writing until reasonable questions are answered. To that I replied by writing to several representative people with this question. Well, what do you want in the tenth book? Tell me. Tell me what you want. Tell me what I've missed in other books, and I will write that tenth book. So, as a result of the letters I've received in answer to my questions, I have written this book, which you are about to read. Some of you, no doubt, will say that it is a repetition here and there. I can only reply that it is the unanimous request of my panel of readers, or it would not be in this book. And if you think it is repetitious in places, well, it might serve to refresh your memory. One question I am asked in particular is, Dr. Rampa, visit me in the astral. Cure me of this. Cure me of that. Tell me who's going to win the Irish sweepstake. Come along to our group meeting in the astral. But these readers forget that there are only 24 hours in each day. They also forget the difference in time zones, etc., etc., even more important, they forget that although I, in the astral, can see them clearly when I want to, yet they may not always be able to see me, although an astonishing number of people have written to me confirming exactly astral visits, telepathic contacts, etc. Well, it's not intended that this shall be a long letter, so let's get on with the book itself, shall we? Tuesday, Lob Sang Rampa Chapter 1 The soft summer night sighed gently and whispered quietly to the nodding willows fringing the serpent temple. Faint ripples undulated across the placid lake as some early rising fish sought the surface in search of unwary insects. Above the hard, high mountain peaks with the everlasting spume of snow flying banner-wise from it, a solitary star shone with glittering brilliance in the luminescent sky. In the granaries, faint squeaks and rustles betrayed the presence of hungry mice foraging in the barley barrels. Stealthy footsteps and two glaring eyes, as Watchman Cat appeared on the scene, brought a scuffle of scurrying mice and then utter silence. Watchman Cat sniffed around suspiciously, then, satisfied, jumped to a low window and sat looking out at the fast approaching dawn. Flickering butter lamps hissed and spat and momentarily flared brighter as night-duty acolytes replenished their supplies. 
From some inner temple came a subdued murmur and the tiny tinkle of different silver bells. Out upon a high roof a solitary figure stood to greet the coming dawn, hands already clasped around the neck of the morning call trumpet. Shadowy, indistinct figures appeared at some back entrance and gathered to march down the mountain trail towards a small tributary of the Happy River from whence came the water supply for the needs of the Patala. Aged men, husky men, and mere wisps of boys, members of the serving class, marched in age-old procession down the mountainside, carrying hard leather pails to dip in the river and then laboriously manhandle up to the kitchens and storage tanks. The downward trip was easy, a half-awake throng still bemusedly thinking of the joys of sleep. By the little well, so constantly filled by the tributary, they stood a while, chatting, exchanging gossip, gleaned from the kitchens the day before, lounging, killing time, postponing the inevitable and hard climb up the mountainside. Overhead, night had already given way to the approaching day. The purple curtain of night had fled to the west before the advancing dawn. The sky no longer showed the brilliant hard pinpoints of light, which were the stars in their courses, but instead was luminous with the rays of the approaching sun, striking through the lower levels and lighting up the undersides of the slight alto stratus clouds which scurried above. The mountain peaks were now tinged with gold, a white gold which threw rainbows from the blowing snow at the peak heads, and which made each mountain top appear as if it were a living fountain of iridescent color. Swiftly the light advanced, and the valley of Lhasa, hitherto in the purple shadows of the night, lit up great flashing gleams shone from the golden roofs of the Patala, and reflected also from the Zhou Kang Cathedral in Lhasa City. At the foot of the Patala, near the colored carvings, a little group of early risers gazed up in awe at the scintillating lights above them, thinking that it must be a reflection of the spirit of the inmost one. At the foot of our mountain path, however, the serving monks, quite immune to the glories of nature, stood chatting, killing time before taking up their burdens and proceeding uphill. The old monk, Big Ears, stood upon a flat rock and gazed out across the lake and the nearby river. Did you hear what the traders were saying in the city yesterday? he asked a younger monk, standing beside him. No, replied the younger one, but the traders always have wonderful tales to tell. What did you hear, old one? Old Big Ears worked his jaws around a bit and wiped his nose at the end of his robe. Then he spat expertly and with precision between two filled buckets. I had to go into the city yesterday, he said, and there, in the street of shops, I chanced upon some traders displaying their wares. One of them seemed to be a knowledgeable sort of man, just like me, in fact, so I tarried in my task and talked to him. He stopped a moment and chewed around his jaws again and looked at the rippling water. Somewhere, in the distance, a small acolyte had thrown a pebble and hit a frog, and now the frog was croaking in astonished complaint. A knowledgeable man he was, a man who had travelled to many strange parts. He told me that once he had left his homeland of India, 
and traveled across the great waters to Meraki. I told him that I had to see about new buckets because some of ours were worn out, and he said that in Meraki no one had to carry buckets of water up a mountain path. Everyone has water in their houses, he said. It runs through pipes. They have a special room where they get a lot of water called the bathroom. The younger monk started with surprise and said, Water in their houses, eh? And in a special room, too, eh? That sounds too marvelous to be true. I wish we had something like that here. But, of course, you can't believe all these travelers' tales. I once heard a trader telling me that in some lands they have light as bright as lightning, which they keep in glass bottles, and it turns the night into day. He shook his head, as if he could hardly believe the things he had heard, and the old monk, Big Ears, afraid that he was going to be ousted as the teller of tales, resumed. Yes, in the land of Meraki, they have many wonderful things. This water, it's in every house. You turn a piece of metal and the water comes gushing out, hot or cold, whichever you want, as much as you want, whenever you want it. It's a great miracle by Buddha's tooth, he said. I certainly would like some other way of getting water up to the kitchens. Many a long year have I been doing this, carrying and carrying water and nothing but water. I feel that I've walked my feet and my legs right down to the knees, and I've got a permanent tilt to the side through fighting against the mountain's pull. Still, water in every room, it's not possible. Together they lapsed into silence, and then started into alertness as down the path strode one of the guardians of our law, the proctors. The immense man strode along, and each one of the monks found urgent business to attend to. One poured out his pail of water and refilled it. Another picked up two pails and hurried up, striding along the mountain path. Soon all the monks were on the move, carting water, the first round of the water carriers for the day. The proctor gazed around for a few moments, and then he too made his way up the mountain path after them. Silence, comparative silence, fell upon the scene, disturbed only by the faint chanting from the mountain top above and by the sleepy protests of some bird who thought it was rather too early to get up and go about the business of the day. Old Mrs. McDuggan cackled as if she had just laid an oversized egg and turned to her friend Mrs. O'Flanagan. No more of these lectures for me, she said, telling us that the priests of Tibet can do telepathy. What nonsense! What will they ask us to believe next? Mrs. O'Flanagan snorted like a Salvation Army trumpeter at his best and remarked, Why can't they use telephones like the rest of us? That's what I want to know. So the two ladies went their way, unaware that they were the other side of the coin. Monks in Tibet could not believe houses could have running water in rooms, and the two Western women could not believe that priests of Tibet could telepathize. But are we not all like that? Can we see the other fellow's point of view? Do we realize that what is commonplace here is the strangest of strange there? and vice versa. Our first request is about life after death, or death, or contact with those who have left this life. First of all, let us deal with the person who is leaving this earth. 
the person is very, very sick usually, and death follows as a result of the breakdown of the human body mechanism. The body becomes untenable, inoperable. It becomes a clay case enshrouding the immortal spirit, which cannot bear such restraint. So the immortal spirit leaves. When it has left the dead body, when it has left the familiar confines of the earth, the, what shall we call it, soul, over self, spirit, or what? Let's call it soul this time for a change. The soul, then, is in strange surroundings where there are many more senses and faculties than those experienced on earth. Here on earth, we have to clomp around or sit in a tin box, which we call a car, but unless we are rich enough to pay airfares, we are earthbound. Not so when we are out of the body, because when out of the body, when in this new dimension, which we will call the astral world, we can travel at will and instantly by thought. We do not have to wait for a bus or a train. We are not hampered by a car nor an airplane where one waits longer in a waiting room than one spends on the actual journey. In the astral, we can travel at any speed we will. We will is a deliberate pair of words because we actually will the speed at which we travel, the height and the route. If, for example, you want to enjoy the wondrous scenery of the astral world, with its verdant pastures and its lushly stocked lakes, we can drift as light as thistle down just above the land, just above the water, or we can rise higher and soar over the astral mountain tops. When we are in this new and wonderful dimension, we are experiencing so many changes that, unless we are very careful, we tend to forget that those who mourn us on that awful old ball of earth, which we have so recently left, we tend to forget. But if people on earth mourn us too fervently, then we feel inexplicable twinges and pulls, and strange feelings of sorrow and sadness. Any of you who have neuritis or chronic toothache will know what it's like. You get a sudden vicious jerk at a nerve, which nearly lifts you out of the chair. In the same way, when we are in the astral world, and a person is mourning us with deep lamentation, Instead of getting on with their own affairs, they hinder us. They provide unwanted anchors, which retard our progress. Let us go just a little beyond our first days in the astral. Let us go to the time when we have entered the Hall of Memories, when we have decided what work we are going to do in the astral how we are going to help others, how we are going to learn ourselves. Let us imagine that we are busy at our task of helping or learning, and then just imagine a hand jerking at the back of our neck. Tweak, 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 and pull, pull, pull. It distracts the attention. It makes learning hard. It makes helping others very difficult because we cannot add our full concentration or attention to that which we should be doing because of the insistent tug and interference caused by those mourning us upon the earth. Many people seem to think that they can get in touch with those who have passed over by going to a back street medium, paying a few dollars or a few shillings, and just getting a message like having a telephone answered by an intermediary. 
Well, even this telephone business. Try telephoning Spain from Canada. Try telephoning England from Uruguay. First, you have the difficulty that the intermediary, that is, the telephone operator on Earth, or the medium, is not familiar with the circumstances, may even be not very familiar with the language in which we desire to speak. And then there are all sorts of hisses and clicks and clunks on the wire. Reception may be difficult. Reception, in fact, is often impossible. Yet here on Earth, we know the telephone number we desire to call, but who is going to tell you that the telephone number of a person who recently left the Earth and now lives in the astral world? A telephone number in the astral world? Well, near enough. Because every person on every world has a personal frequency, a personal wavelength. In just the same way as the BBC radio stations, or the Voice of America stations in the U.S., have their own frequencies, so do people have frequencies. And if we know those frequencies, we can tune in to the radio station, provided atmospheric conditions are suitable, and the time of day is correct and the station is actually broadcasting. It is not possible to tune in and be infallibly sure that you can receive a station for the simple reason that something may have put them out of action. It is the same with people who have passed beyond this life. You may be able to get in touch with them if you know their basic personal frequency, and if they are able to receive a telepathic message on that frequency. For the most part, unless a medium is very, very experienced indeed, he or she can be led astray by some nuisance entities who are playing at being humans and who can pick up the thoughts of what the caller wants. That is, Supposing Mrs. Brown, a new widow, wants to get in touch with Mr. Brown, a newly freed human who has escaped to the other side. One of these lesser entities who are not humans can perceive what she wants to ask Mr. Brown and can perceive from Mrs. Brown's thoughts how Mr. Brown spoke and what he looked like. So the entity, like a naughty schoolboy who didn't get the discipline that he sadly needed, can influence the well-meaning medium by giving her a description of Mr. Brown, which has just been obtained from the mind of Mrs. Brown. The medium will give startling proof by describing in detail the appearance of Mr. Brown, who is standing by me now. Well, the very experienced person cannot be deceived in this way, but the very experienced person is few and far between, and just does not have time to deal with such things. Furthermore, when commerce comes into it, when a person demands such and such a sum for a mediumistic sitting, a lower vibration is brought into the proceedings, and a genuine message is thus all too frequently prevented. It is unkind and unfair to let your sorrows harm and handicap a person who has left the earth and who is now working elsewhere. After all, supposing you were very busy at some important task, and supposing some other person, whom you could not see, kept jerking at the nape of your neck and prodding you, and blaring silly thoughts into your ears, your concentration would go, and you really would call down all sorts of unkind thoughts upon your tormentor. Be sure 
that if you really love the person who has left the earth and if that person really loves you, you will meet again because you will be attracted together when you leave the earth. In the astral world, you cannot meet a person whom you hate or who hates you. It just cannot be done because that would disrupt the harmony of the astral world and that cannot be. Of course, if you are doing astral travel, you can go to the lower astral, which is, one might say, the waiting room or entrance to the real astral world. In the lower astral, one can discuss differences with some heat, but in the higher regions, no. So, remember this. If you really love the other person, and the other person really loves you, you will be together again, but on a very different footing. There will be none of the misunderstandings, as upon this earth, one cannot tell lies in the astral world, because in that world everyone can see the aura. And if an astral dweller tells a lie, then anyone in sight knows about it immediately because of the discord which appears in his personal vibrations and in the colors of the aura. So one learns to be truthful. People seem to have the idea that unless they have a lavish funeral for the departed and go into ecstasies of sorrow, they are not showing a proper appreciation of the deceased. But that is not the case. Mourning is selfish. Mourning causes grave interference and disturbance to the person newly arrived in the astral. It is better and shows greater respect and thought to control grief and avoid hysterical outbursts which cause such distress to people who have really left. The astral worlds, yes, that's definitely plural, are very real. Things are as real and as substantial upon those worlds as they appear to us to be here on this earth. Actually, they appear more substantial because there are extra senses, extra abilities, extra colors and extra sounds. We can do so much more in the astral state. Dr. Rampa, you have told us so much about the astral world in your books, but you haven't told us enough. What do people do? What do they eat? How do they occupy their time? Can't you tell us this? Most certainly I can tell you, because I have eidetic memory, that is, I can remember everything that ever happened to me. I can remember dying and being born, and I have the great advantage that I can astral travel when fully conscious. So let us look at this matter of the astral worlds and what one does. In the first case, there is not just one astral world, but many, as many in fact as there are different vibrations of people. Perhaps the best way of realizing this is by considering radio. In radio, there are many, many different radio stations in all parts of the world. If those stations tried to share a common wavelength or frequency, there would be bedlam. Everybody would interfere with everyone else, and so radio stations each have their own separate frequency. And if you want the BBC, London, you tune in to those frequencies allotted to the BBC. If you want Moscow, you tune in to the frequencies allotted to Moscow. There are thousands of different radio stations, each with their own frequency. 
each a separate entity not interfering with the others. In the same way, astral worlds are different planes of existence having different frequencies, so that upon astral world X, for example, you'll get all people who are compatible within certain limits. In Astral World Y, you'll find another set of people who are compatible within their own limits. Lower down, in what we call the Lower Astral, there are conditions somewhat the same as on Earth. That is, there are mixed types of people and the average person who gets out of his body during the hours of sleep and goes astral traveling, he goes to that lower astral where all entities may mix. The lower astral, then, is a meeting place for people of different races and different creeds and even from different worlds. It is very similar to life upon Earth. As we progress higher, we find the frequencies becoming purer and purer. Whereas in the lower astral, you can have an argument with a person and tell him you hate the sight of him if you want to. When you get higher in the astral planes, you cannot, because you cannot get people who are opposed to each other. So remember that the astral worlds are like radio stations with different frequencies, or, if you wish, like a big school with different classrooms, each succeeding class being higher in vibration than the one before. So that class, or grade one, is a common denominator class, or astral world, where all may meet while the process of assessing their capacities goes on. Then, as they do their allotted tasks, and we'll deal with that in a moment, they become raised higher and higher until, eventually, they pass out of the astral plane of worlds altogether and enter into a state where there is no longer rebirth, reincarnation, and where people now deal with much higher forms of being than humans. But you want to know what happens when you die. Well, actually I have told you a lot about it in my previous books. You leave your body and your astral form floats off and goes to the lower astral, where it recovers from shocks and harm caused by living or dying conditions on Earth. Then, after a few days, according to Earth Time Reckoning, one sees all one's past in the Hall of Memories, sees what one has accomplished and what one has failed to accomplish, and by assessing the successes or failures, one can decide on what has to be learned in the future. That is, shall one reincarnate again right away, or shall one spend perhaps 600 years in the astral? It all depends on what a person has to learn. It depends on one's purpose in the scale of evolution. But I've told you all that in previous books. Let me mention another subject for a moment before saying what people do in the astral world. A very pleasant lady wrote to me and said, I'm so frightened. I'm so frightened that I shall die alone with no one to help me, no one to direct me in the path that I should take. You in Tibet had the lamas who directed the consciousness of a dying person. I have no one, and I am so frightened. That is not correct, you know. No one is alone. No one has no one. 
You may think you are alone, and quite possibly there is no one near your earthly body, yet in the astral there are very special helpers who await by the deathbed so that just as soon as the astral form starts to separate from the dying physical body, the helpers are there to give every assistance, just as in the case of a birth there are people waiting to deliver that newborn baby. Death to earth is birth into the astral world, and the necessary trained attendants are there to provide their specialized services. So there's no need to fear. There should never be fear. Remember that when the time comes, as it comes to all of us, we will eventually leave this world of sorrows. There will be people on the other side waiting for you, caring for you, and helping you in precisely the same manner that there are people on earth awaiting the birth of a new baby. When the helpers have this astral body which has just been separated from the dead physical, they treat it carefully and help it with the knowledge of where it is. Many people who have not been prepared think they are in heaven or hell. The helpers tell them exactly where they are. They help them to adjust. They show them the Hall of Memories, and they care for the newcomer as they, in their turn, have been cared for. This matter of hell there is no such thing, you know. Hell was actually a place of judgment near Jerusalem. Hell was a small village near two very high rocks, and between the rocks and extending for some distance around was a quaking bog which sent up gouts of sulfurous vapors, a bog that was always drenched in the stench of burning brimstone. In those far-off days, a person who was accused of a crime was taken to this village and went through hell. He was placed at one end of the bog and was told of the crimes of which he had been accused. He was told that if he could cross the bog unharmed, he was innocent. But if he failed and was swallowed by the bog, he was guilty. Then. The accused was goaded into action. Perhaps a soldier poked him in a delicate part with a spear. Anyway, the poor wretch ran through hell, through all the swirling fog of sulfur and brimstone fumes, along the path surrounded by boiling pitch, where the earth quaked and shook, inspiring terror in the strongest, and if he reached the other side, he had passed through the valley of hell, and had been purged of any offense, and was innocent again. So don't believe that you will go to hell. You won't, because there is no such thing. God, no matter what we call him, is a God of kindness, a God of compassion. No one is ever condemned. No one is ever sentenced to eternal damnation. There are no such things as devils who jump up and down on one and plunge pitchforks into one's shuddering body. That is all a figment in the imagination of crazed priests who tried to gain dominance over the bodies and souls of those who knew no better. There is only hope and knowledge that if one works for it, one can atone for any crime, no matter how bad that crime seems to have been. So, no one is ever extinguished. No one is ever abandoned by God. Most people fear death because they have a murky conscience, and these priests who should know better, 
have taught about hellfire and eternal torment, eternal damnation and all that, and the poor wretched person who has heard all those stories thinks that immediately he dies, he's going to be seized by devils and horrendous things will be wreaked upon him. Don't believe it. Don't believe it at all. I remember all and I can go to the astral at any time and I repeat, there is no such thing as hell. There is no such thing as eternal torment. There is always redemption. There is always another chance. There is always mercy, compassion, and understanding. Those who say that there is hell and torment, well, they're not in their right head. They are saddists or something. They're not worthy of another thought. We fear to die for that reason and for another. We fear to die because the fear is planted in us. If people remembered the glories of the astral world, they would want to go there in droves. They wouldn't want to stay on this earth any longer. They would want to shirk their classes. They would want to commit suicide, and suicide is a very bad thing. You know, it hurts oneself. It doesn't hurt anyone else, but one becomes one of life's dropouts when one commits suicide. Think of it like this. If you are training to be a professional person of some kind, a lawyer or doctor, well, you have to study and you have to pass examinations. But if you lose heart halfway through, you drop out of your course and then you don't become a lawyer or a doctor. And before you can become a lawyer or a doctor, you have to cease being a dropout and get back into the class and study all over again. And by that time, you find the curriculum has changed. There are different textbooks and all you've learned before becomes useless. So, you start at the bottom again. Thus it is, if you commit suicide, well, you have to come back, you reincarnate again, which is just the same as entering college for another course. But you reincarnate again and you learn all the lessons all over again, right from the start. And all you learned before is now obsolete, so you've wasted a lifetime, haven't you? Don't commit suicide. It is never, never, never worth it. Well, that has taken us quite away from what people do in the astral. A lot depends on the state of evolution of the person. A lot of it depends on what that person is preparing for. But the astral worlds are very, very beautiful places. There is wonderful scenery with colors not even dreamed of upon the earth. There is music, a music not even dreamed of upon the earth. There are houses, but each person could build his or her own house by thought. You think it, and if you think hard enough, it is. In the same way, when you get to the astral world, first you're quite naked, just as you are when you came to this earth, and then you think what sort of clothes you're going to wear. You don't have to wear clothes, but most people do, for some strange reason, and one can see the most remarkable collection of garments, because each person makes their own clothes according to any style they are thinking about. In the same way, they build their houses in any style they are thinking about. There are no cars, of course, and no buses, and no trains. You don't need them. Why be cluttered by a car when you can move as fast as you wish? By wishing. So, by thought power alone, you can visit 
any part of the astral world. In the astral, there are many jobs that one can do. You can be a helper to those who are every second arriving from the earth. You can do nursing, you can do healing, because many of those who arrive from the earth are not aware of the reality of the astral, and they believe whatever their religion has taught them to believe. Or, if they are atheists, they believe in nothing, and so they are enshrouded in a black, black fog, a fog that is sticky and confusing. And until they can acquire some sort of understanding that they are blinded by their own folly, they cannot be helped much. So, attendants follow them around and try to break away the fog. Then there are those who counsel the astral people who have to return to Earth. Where do they want to go? What sort of parents do they want? What sort of family conditions? Rich family or a poor family? What sort of conditions would enable them to do the task which they plan to do? It all looks so easy when in the astral world, but it is not always so easy when one is on the earth, you know? In the lower astral, people often eat. They can smoke also if they want to. Whatever they want to eat is actually manufactured from the atmosphere by thought. Not so amazing when you think of prana, which is believed in implicitly on earth. So you can eat what you wish, you can drink what you wish, but actually all that is just folly because one is acquiring all the energy, all the sustenance from the atmospheric radiations, and eating and drinking is just a habit. One soon shucks off those habits and is the better for it. You can take it then that one does much the same in the lower astral as one does upon the earth. Yes, Mrs. So-and-so, there is a sex life in the astral as well, but it is far, far better than anything you can ever experience on the earth, because you have such an enhanced range of sensations. So, if you have not had much of a balanced sex life on earth, remember that in the astral you will have because it is necessary to make a balanced person. Of course, the higher one rises in the astral worlds, that is, the more one increases one's personal vibrations, then the better the experiences, the more pleasant they become, and the more satisfying the whole existence becomes. Many people on earth are all members of a group. You may have, for example, and for example only, ten people who together really complete one astral entity. On the earth we have these ten people and perhaps three, four, five, or six die. Well, the person who is in the astral does not become really complete until all the group are united. It is very difficult explaining such a thing because it involves different dimensions which are not even known upon this earth. But you have felt a remarkable affinity with a certain person, a person who, of course, is absolutely separate from you. You may have thought how compatible you were with that person, you may feel a sense of loss when that person goes away. Well, quite possibly that person is a member of your group. And when you die to this earth, you will be united together as one entity. Upon the earth, all these people are like tentacles reaching out 
to get different sensations, different experiences during that brief flickering of consciousness which comprises the lifetime upon earth. Yet, when all the members of that group, when all the tentacles are pulled in, one has in effect the experience of, perhaps, ten lifetimes in one. One has to come to earth to learn the hard material things because there are no such experiences in the astral world. Not everyone is a member of a group, you know, but you probably know whole groups of people who just cannot manage without each other. It may be members of a big family. They're always dashing around to see how the others are doing. And even when they marry, they still have to forsake their partners at times and rush back home as if they are all going in like a lot of chickens under the old hen. Many people are individualists, not members of a group upon earth. They have come to do certain things alone, and they rise or fall by their own efforts on the earth. The poor souls often have a very bad time indeed upon the earth, and it doesn't necessarily mean that they have immense karmic debts because they get suffering. It means that they're doing special work and incurring good karma for a few lives to come. Really experienced people can tell what other people have been in a past life, but don't believe the advertisement you read where, for a small sum of money, you can have all your past incarnations told. Don't believe that for a moment, because most of these people who make such claims are fakes. If they demand money for such a service, then you can be sure that they are fakes, because the really trained person does not take money for these occult purposes, as it lowers the personal vibrations. It is such a tragic thing that so many advertisements appear which are errant fakes. People flit about examining the Akashic record or looking into the past to see what you did wrong or looking a bit forward to see what you did right, provided you pay enough money. And then all these cults who teach you the mystery of the ages, provided you pay a monthly sum for the rest of your life. Some of these are just ordinary commercial correspondence colleges. They want your money. Possibly they might do you some good. They might teach you not to believe all advertisements, for example. But my own point of view is this. If a person advertises in glamorous terms what he or she can do for a small outlay, well, be suspicious. If these people could do it, they would do it for themselves and get money and power that way. The fact that they have to run a correspondence course or do this or that service makes them, in my opinion, suspect. And I sincerely wish that there was some way in which these advertisements could be censored and controlled. There are many, many people who are utterly genuine. But my own personal experience is that it is rare indeed for such a person to advertise. Remember also that people who make these wondrous claims about how they go into the astral for you and look at all your records, etc., etc., well, you can't prove them really wrong, can you? Just the same as you can't prove them right. So, just to be on the safe side, it's far better not to bother with people who advertise such as this. But instead, meditate. Because if you meditate, you can get the results you want. 
You know yourself better than any other person, and most assuredly you know yourself better than a person who's going to charge you a couple of dollars for this or that service. Most times all he does is to put out a pre-printed form in an envelope and mail it to you under the heading of Strictly Private and Personal. Here's another sad little extract from a letter. I recently lost a friend of many years. My little pet has died and I am broken-hearted and wondering. My parish priest told me that I was a bad woman to dare to suggest that animals have souls. He said that only humans have souls, and more or less implied that only those humans who belong to his own branch of the church. Can you give me any hope that I will see my beloved pet in another life? Some priests are real jackasses, you know. They are astonishingly ignorant men. It always amazes me. Well, let us take Christians. Christians almost go to war as to which sect is the true sect. Christians preaching Christianity do not show Christianity to Christians of another sect. Look at the Protestants and the Catholics. You would think they had bought up all the front row seats in heaven the way they go on. Catholics seem to think that Protestants are evil people, and Protestants are quite sure that Catholics are evil people. But that's not a matter of discussion at present. For centuries, asinine preachers have taught that man is the ultimate in development. They've taught that there cannot be anything higher than mankind, and mankind alone has a soul, provided that they be of this that specific religion. I say to you, with absolute knowledge, that, yes, animals also go to the astral world. Animals have the same opportunities as humans. I say to you, yes, you can meet your beloved pets again, not merely when you yourself die to this earth, but now, in astral travel, to the zone in which those animals are. Only an utter fool, only a complete and absolute ignoramus such as a priest of some derelict, decadent religion, would believe that man has a soul copyright, so to speak, on souls. Consider this. UFOs are real. There are other people in space, people so highly evolved, so highly intelligent, that intelligent humans now are, by comparison to these space people, as stupid as a dress shop dummy. You know, one of those plaster or plastic figures standing stiffly in the dress with some hideous frock stuck on over it? One of the reasons why religious bodies deny the existence of UFOs is because their very presence shows that man is not the ultimate form of evolution. If the priests are right and man is the ultimate form of evolution, then what are these people in space? They are real people, they are intelligent people, and some of them are spiritual people. They have souls. They too go to the astral worlds just as do humans, just as do animals, cats, horses, dogs, etc. Very definitely, very emphatically, and speaking with the utter knowledge of one who does astral travel as a matter of course, let me tell you this. Yes, my friend, your pet lives in another sphere, lives in good health, 
and in better shape, even more pleasant to look at, perhaps even missing you. But now, with the knowledge that you can meet again, for, as in the case of humans, if you really love your pet, and your pet really loves you, you can, and you will, meet again. Let me tell you that Mrs. Fifi Grey Whiskers, my truly beloved friend, left this earth some time ago. She is still my beloved friend, and I can visit her in the astral. And Miss Koo E also left this world when she was badly upset by another attack of press persecution. Miss Q.E. was ill at the time, and these moronic press people thundering around upset her, and, well, she left me. I was sad, sad for myself, sad that I could no longer cradle her in my arms, but glad that she had relief from the sorrows and the utter miseries which she and I had endured together on this earth. I tell you, I meet her in the astral, so I am in a very, very definite position to tell you that the priests are wrong. Mankind is not the epitome of spiritual development. Some animals are far more spiritual than man. Let us close this chapter, then, with the repetition of that statement. I repeat, yes, all you who grieve for those little pets who have left this earth and gone on beyond, grieve no more. For if you love your departed pet, and that pet loves you, you will be together again beyond the confines of this earth, just as Mrs. Fifi Grey Whiskers and the Lady Kui and I meet so often in the astral, and as we shall be together on a much more permanent basis when, and may it be soon, this life on earth ends for me, and when there is a cessation of press persecution and hostility, when there is a cessation of pain and misery which long-drawn-out illness causes. End of chapter 1